Although Southwark House, north of Portsmouth, is where strategic decisions were taken, Southampton was the springboard for D-Day and the headquarters for the day-to-day -day running of Operation Overlord. In his diary, Sergeant McCorkey first visits Southampton on D-Day, Tuesday the 6th of June, and sleeps overnight at the docks. On the 7th of June, he shoots his first film, and according to his diary, takes this film on the following day, Thursday the 8th of June. In his letter to his mother dated the 9th of June, McCorkey says at least the weather is mild and bearable. He goes on to say, But now about the invasion, you are probably following it with your ear to the radio as millions of others are and wondering about their sons. I am still in England and for how long I can only speculate. The day the invasion was launched, I, like the other cameraman, was rushed to the dock side to photograph the casualties returning or any other developments that might occur. McCorkey says the first landing ship tank, LST, pulled in about 11am with casualties returning from France. In his letter McCorkey refers to the wounded arriving back at port and in the film we can see the wounded unloaded from an LST at Embarkation Hard S2 next to the Royal Pier in Southampton. The film goes on to show soldiers crowded around a newspaper and they must be reading the first accounts of the Allied landing. In the background of the film is the town quay at Southampton and on the other side of the berth the pavilion at the end of the pier, now derelict. As McCorkey pans along the queue at the rear of the ambulances, we get a running view of the old pier in the background. In his letter he refers to the prisoners of war and in the film we see them marching past the pier gates and we can just see the edge of the gatehouse to the pier, now a restaurant. The prisoners of war are seen walking towards a column outside the docks which is a memorial to the site from which the Pilgrim Fathers originally set sail for the New World in the Mayflower and Speedwell. In his letter he says, Yesterday and today we made movies of German prisoners who laugh into your camera and almost all of them carry a valise or bundle with their possessions. They seem to be happy to be out of it. McCorkey's remarks seem to reflect the relative high spirits of the German prisoners compared to the British troops. And it's true the prisoners of war believed Normandy was only a short-term setback and that they were simply biding their time until the Allies were thrown back into the sea. The story goes a group of prisoners of war were taken in a motor launch around the port and were open-mouthed by what their own propaganda had told them was destroyed in the Blitz of 1939-40. In his letter, McCorkey says, Returning soldiers, broken in body and spirit, minus legs and arms, and as usual, the majority of them just kids. But there is one difference. I photographed the English casualties and they gave me the impression of being completely broken in spirit, but not the Canadians. He goes on to say, Englishmen I talk to are big in their praise for the Canadians and eager to sing their praises. McCorkey says he would like to go into more detail, but security regulations do not permit it. The arriving patients were to undergo two stages of triage and emergency treatment. Holding units at the docks and hards were to give surgical treatment to men tagged by LST doctors as requiring immediate attention before further transportation. The rest of the patients were to go by ambulance directly from the ships to transit hospitals 15 to 30 miles inland. These hospitals were to separate wounded again between those unable to travel and those ready for rail movement to general hospitals for definitive treatment. However, during the first days of combat, when the beachhead was shallowest, holding units and transit hospitals assumed many functions of division clearing stations, but still managed to keep wounded flowing from the coast to the large hospital centres in the north and west of England. Corky ends by saying, This is not much of a letter, but I'm going to close as I am very tired and must get some sleep. I hope you and Dad are both well and not worrying about me.